When I announced, hey, and, and the speakers at this event will be President George Bush, silent, because some people were not wanting to see him. Some people were very happy, but it was 50-50. I said, Kobe, everybody flipped out. They lost their mind. So Kobe, uh, uh, President Bush comes. We, we do the event. There's 6,000 people there, 6,200. And uh, we have a great conversation in the back. And then afterwards, he's doing photo op with 100 people that qualify to do the pictures. And I'm standing there the entire time because I just want to hear what people are going to say. And people would say things like, let me tell you, I saw you as this. And when you were president, I thought you were this. And I thought you were that. But the message you gave today, because he just opened up. He says, let me tell you what I did. I used to do this. I had a bad habit of doing this. I had a bad habit of doing this. What, the way he spoke that day, everybody fell in love with the guy that day, the way he spoke, President Bush. So it, it's interesting that you're saying how one day they love you, next day they hate you, next day they miss you, the next day they hate you. You have to be patient because if you're loved today, take your time. Someone's going to hate you in about a couple yeah. months. Yeah. And if they hate you yeah. today, be patient. Trust me, there's love around the corner as well. <laughs> this whole concept about how you deal with love-hate relationship, how did yeah. you handle that as a player? Because that's that's got to be something you experienced well, a lot. Well, I played with two most historic teams. You know, I, I consider myself really lucky, you know, uh, being drafted by the Red Sox out of the University of Texas, you know. So, I mean, the Rangers and the Astros were following me so close at Texas. You know, again, I, I, I got to go back to when I was in high school. I was the third best pitcher on the team. I had two. I, I, I took classes early so I could graduate at 17. Um, but when uh, there were two other guys, a righty and lefty, that back in the 80s that threw over 90 miles an hour, which was, you know, rare, uh, the scouts were coming to watch him. Now, we got in the playoffs a couple times. I was a better defensive end than I was probably a pitcher first baseman. And uh, really, yeah, I was six two. I was still, you know, baby fat. You know, I was young. Roger, your hands are uh, massive hands. Yeah, yeah, I got my granddad. Holy I got my freaking granddaddy's those hands paws. are. Yeah, is that a benefit for a pitcher or is well, that for that split finger? It is. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, it is. Yeah. So Look at the size of that ring, by yeah, way. that's our national. I wear my national championship ring more, and I do. Uh, Why is that? Uh, Why? Just because. Um, more pride. I, I, yeah, it, I, I, it got start. It really happened for me at the university. I, again. Um, you know, jumping around. I had three wonderful coaches coming up. You know, I lost my pops. My high school coach, um, great, great coach, better teacher of the game and life lessons. Then I go and I get to play for Wayne Graham, one of the winningest coaches in college baseball, turn the University of Rice program around. Great coach, better teacher of the game, baseball lifer. And um, he watched me grow and mature that year. Pop over to Texas, play for the winningest coach at that time. Uh, Cliff Gustafson, and um, Gus, the same thing. Great coach, uh, better man and teacher of what we are doing, life lessons. Uh, my boys go to University of Texas. They play for their winningest coach in baseball, Augie Garrido, who since since passed. Augie, was, Augie was, gave them some great life lessons. So, uh, again, that's where I came from. I, I was the third best pitcher. I tell the kids, nobody, but I threw strikes, and I had a little Bugs Bunny curveball. So when those older guys, everybody came to see him, they didn't wet the bed, they shit the bed. Coach would bring me in the game because I threw strikes. He, coach always said after, you know, I got, uh, I, I made it a couple years in the big leagues, he said, you know, uh, that kid, I could bring him in, turn the lights out in the stadium, he could throw strikes. So then when I got to Texas, we didn't, there was no baseball lifting stuff. We lifted with the football guys. So my legs got stronger, grew two inches, Fastball start jumping. Next thing you know, I mean, the same reason why I went to Texas on scholarship. Mom didn't have the money, so I was paving my way, and she wanted me to stay in school. When I, when I got drafted um, after my freshman year, um, the scout said, you know, if he didn't sign right now, he'd probably never get another chance. My mom basically told him, and I was in my room crying for two days. She kicked the scout out of the house and said, he's going to school. I want him to get his education. So – that's kind of how that's that's you know that's kind of how my path you know took place and then um, Boston drafted me. I was like Boston. Well, I don't even know. I wasn't sure where even where Boston was. You know. <laughs> and uh, but my mom, the history. We we love history, and um, uh, uh, she wrote me a poem about Fenway Park. And then when I got to Fenway, um, you know the Green Monster. The the, be the best was when they called me up. Uh, I don't think cell phones are there. This is 83, and I was watching a game. I think Dennis Eckersley and Palmer were pitching, but they bring me in. I get in the cab in, at the airport, and I've got my face in a paper, and the guy stops, cabbie stops, and this brick. I see this brick building, and the cabbie goes, here you go, kid. I go, cabbie, I, I'm a professional ball player. I'm going to Fenway Park. 
I said, this is a, looks like a warehouse. Because I see the brick only, you know. And he goes, this is Fenway Park, kid. Get, get your ass out of my cab. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and, and I get out, and the team meets me, and they bring me up the tunnel, and the tunnel right, you know, on first base side where you see the green monster. And then to go, you know, there uh, and, and jump forward, playing as long as I did, both the two older boys, and I had – Devin, I had a little 10-year break, and then the other boys are in their 20s now. Um they were able to see me play long enough when the boys make a comment, it's like, Pops, and you know, you pitched right where Luke Garrett gave his farewell speech. Mm. Or, you know, they I played in the Bob Hope tournament 20 years. I had Yogi Bear as my partner a couple of times, you know, having right. Yogi. I mean, the guy's got – he's got 10 rings. Was he know. funny as hell? Was he? Oh, yeah. Oh, he played it up. I told him, I said, hey, about third or fourth hole, all this media following us, I, I want to get an 8 by 10 of you and I. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to line my putt up. I want you leaning over like you're reading it for me. But we were doing it seriously. There was a, it was funky, and I kind of knew which way it was going to break, but I hear we staged this photo, and people are everywhere, and I, out loud, I go, Yogi, what do you think? Which way? You know, what, what, which way is this ball going? He goes, better you than me, kid, and he walked <laughs> off. And it, it was a little – Yeah, he, he was – I always told Yogi that uh, the two catchers I wish I would have thrown to were Yogi and Johnny Bench. And uh, Yogi goes, why, why, why me? I said, because I see all the ho- uh, old photos of you, Yogi, and uh, you never could squat down. You, you know, I would get the high strike for sure because you could never squat. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.